Hello everybody, my name is Chris Brady, author of the Boeing 737 Tech Guide and the Boeing 737 Tech Site. And this presentation is about Windows. So, contents for this, um, flight deck windows, eyebrow windows, the construction of uh, those said windows, a little bit about the hydrophobic, co hydrophobic coating, um, window heat, fringe patterns, uh, close look at window number two, sun visors, window problems, frame cracks, QRH procedures, passenger windows and miscellaneous windows and I'll leave it as um, a test for you guys watching uh, as to what those miscellaneous windows might be see if you can guess by the time we get to it um, as ever there's there's a lot in this there's there's a lot more than I thought there was going to be when I when I started the video um, for pilots as always it'll take you in far more depth than the uh, than the FCOMs um, for engineers, it'll be a, a hope a useful revision uh, for you, and and also give you a little insight into um, the, the the pilot's sort of uh, view on things, if you forgive the pun. Um, as always, treat your company training and manuals as the authoritative source of information. Okay, so let's start off with the uh, the most obvious, the uh, the flight deck windows. Um, Starting at the very beginning, there are, well, there certainly used to be five on each side, uh, numbered one, two, three, four, five left, and one, two, three, four, five right on the other side. Um, those aircraft without eyebrow windows are just simply labeled one to three left and right. So, the eyebrow windows, what uh, what were they all about? And it's quite possible plenty of you have flown, uh, have never flown an aircraft with eyebrow windows. Um, Back in Feb 20, uh, sorry, 2005, the, um, the the first 73 flew without eyebrow windows, and thereafter they've all been produced without them. Previously, they all had them. Uh, they were standard in Boeing aircraft, going right back to World War II bombers to give crew better visibility. Um, I guess somebody took a, a decision that you know they, they were no longer required, and uh, they were removed from production. Um, Boeing's claim that the, it gives a, a weight reduction of nine kilos or twenty pounds for the uh, the Americans out there, um, and eliminates around about three hundred hours of periodic inspections over the life of the aircraft. Now, the, the, the phasing out of eyebrow windows actually coincided with a couple of problems uh, in in eyebrow windows. Uh, the, the beset the NG and I think the two things may be related. Um, I don't have any hard evidence on that but um, I'll come on and I'll describe those those events that happened later in the, the presentation but um, as I, say, I, I think um, eyebrow window failures did actually prompt the, the move to away from eyebrow windows. Um, so if you've got an aircraft with eyebrow windows and for whatever reason you want to convert it uh, retrofit kits are available. Um, th there are closeout panels and insulation blankets uh, to to replace where the the transparencies used to be. And there's some photos of of that task being completed there. It was initially reported that the military versions, so the the, the P8 and E7 family, would keep the eyebrow windows for visibility. Um, during manoeuvring and air-to-air -air refueling operations, uh, as, as you can see in this photo. Um, but as you can also see in this photo, that was uh, that was not the case. Um, I mean, you'd have thought that this task of all, you know, the air-to-air -air refueling one would require <laughs> or, or would have the greatest need for eyebrow windows. But, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I've never done it. I'd be interested to hear from any of you guys on the um, the, the P8 or the E7 who, who, who've done air to air refueling, you know, do, do you miss them? Um, then again, you probably wouldn't know because you probably haven't flown a civilian one which has them. Um, anywho, food for thought. So let's move on to the uh, the construction of the uh, of the windows. They're they're made by PPG, which is Pittsburgh Plate Glass uh, Aerospace out in Alabama. Um, Previous manufacturers have been Triplex and uh, Cirrusin. Each window weighs around about 23 kilos. The, the, well, each window is obviously a slightly different weight because it's a different shape. Uh, the the windows one, uh, one left and right, each are 23 kilos. That's 50 pounds. So there's, there's some some considerable weight in those. Um, for 
how they're constructed, I'm sure you're probably aware that they're made of several layers. Um, so, so let me take you through what, what, what those layers are. Um, the inner pane is glass. That's the thickest layer. It's about half an inch thick. That's the primary structural pane. That carries the aircraft pressure load. In the middle, you've got the vinyl layer. Now this is a fail-safe structural pane, so if the inner one were to fail, the vinyl should be able to withstand the, uh, the, the pressure load of the aircraft. Slightly thinner at uh, 0.38 of an inch. And then the outer layer is glass. That isn't structural, that, uh, that won't hold the pressure load. Um, the purpose of that, it, 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 it's like a scratch-resistant cover to, to keep the view clear. Uh, it, it's made of incredibly tough stuff, um, so it, it you know it, it doesn't scratch or chip, and that's quite thin at just under 0.2 of an inch. There is also, as I'm sure you were, a, a heating layer, sort of conductive heating layer between, and that sits between the outer glass layer and the vinyl layer. So they're your basic layers. Um, but what I'll do now is I'll I'll just take you through each of those layers in a little bit more depth and and, and also discuss of you know how the the, the window is is constructed um, and, and particularly the way that they're bound together at the edges. So um, this diagram's from PPG it's, uh, themselves um, and taking you through the, the 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 layers by stage. So starting with the outer glass pane. And say it's a rigid, hard, scratch-resistant surface. It isn't structural, um, which means if there's any damage to that, you you don't actually need to worry because the the the, the load-bearing uh, panes are the are the inner and to an extent the the, the middle. So um, so if you get damage on the outer, you know, in flight, I'm talking about it's it's. That there isn't any immediate cause for concern. Obviously, snag it when you get down, and the engineers will, you know, do what's necessary. But I say the purpose of that is, is it's it's just a scratch-resistant surface to keep the view clear. It has a hydrophobic coating on it, hydrophobic water repellent, um, as as an alternative to to rain repellent, uh, which is something we used to have in the flight deck. Um, but was phased out in the 90s to keep vision clear in rain and, and I'll go into more depth on that la later on. In between the outer glass pane and the vinyl pane you've got a conductive heating layer um, and this is on all five windows or ten if you count both sides uh, with the possible exception of window number three which isn't always heated and these have got a conductive heating layer of, of um, it's it's a metal called indium tin oxide, um, known as ITO, on the on the inside of of the outer pane. Uh, it's not gold, as uh, <laughs> as urban myth would have it. Um, the, the, there are better and probably cheaper um, materials to use, and indium tin oxide is is the one which is used. Um, and that the, the the purpose of that is is to both de-ice the windscreen and make it less brittle. Um, by by warming it up. G generally speaking, the, the the cooler things are, the colder things are, the, the the more brittle they become. There are some exceptions, but glass isn't one of them. So um, warming it up gives you um, gives you, gives a window strength as as well as clearing it from um, from from ice or you know fogging. Then in the middle, you've got the vinyl layer. Now this is a stretched acrylic, um, and and the one in use at the moment is, is, is polyvinyl butyl (PVB). I say it's a fail-safe structural pane in case for failure of the inner pane. There are two types of acrylic used in in aircraft windows: um, stretched, which this one is, also known as extruded, um, and cast. Uh, I say it's not cast in here. Uh, the, this 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 pane is is stretched. Now stretched is is stronger and, and more durable. It's got better impact resistance than, than cast, so it's it's used in windows one, two, and three. 
Tast, on the other hand, has got better optical clarity. Uh, it's more resistant to crazing and is used in the eyebrow windows, you know, where, where there's less of a need for impact resistance. Cabin windows have actually got a pane of each. So there you go. So, so the, 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 you know, the two are used for different purposes. Um, I guess the takeaway message here is that you know vinyl isn't just vinyl. You know that there's there's different types of it, or you know acrylic, whatever you want to call it. The vinyl layer has also got a urethane interlayer on both sides of it. Now that's a flexible layer, bonds the glass and the acrylic panes to, to, together. And the purpose of that is to prevent any broken glass window from shattering and, and entering the flight deck. So it'll kind of stick to it, I, I guess. Um, that's, that's the purpose of the urethane interlayer. Then you come into the inner layer. I say this is the thickest one. This this is the you know the the, the chunky one at about half an inch or you know just over a centimeter. Um, it carries the uh, if the primary structural pane carries the aircraft pressure load. Um, if that one were to to break in flight, then you would have cause for concern. Fortunately, that is extremely rare. Um, I personally haven't heard of a case of it, but um, I'm sure in the what is it 50, 60 years. That the the seven three has been around that um, it, it it might have happened, um, but it's it's very much designed not to fail. Moving away to the the edges now, uh, you've got an edge member uh, r running around the the the, the perimeter of the window. That's phenolic. It's Basically means you know it's 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 made from phenols, which is you know a chemical process. Um, it's an industrial plastic that that's got good sealant properties, um, and it's the internal frame of the window and runs around the uh, the, the perimeter of the window. So it, it doesn't seem like it in this cross section diagram, but you have to imagine that going all the way around the perimeter of the of the pane. Now in that sort of drill through that there are a, a dozens of aluminium spaces or bushings they're, they're I say drilled through the edge member and they prevent the edge member from clamping up when when the fasteners are, are tightened um, so it doesn't distort the, the 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 window as it's as it's being in, installed there's also a rubber gasket uh, on the the outside there that that makes a pressure seal between the window and the, the aperture in the fuselage And here's a, a photo I got uh, just last year, actually, of um, of a crew replacing a, a, a window. And you, you can, I mean, you can see and count up. There must be, I don't know. I mean, I haven't counted up, but probably about 50 fasteners uh, through the through each each window, um, and they pass through those aluminium spacer tubes or, or, or bushing to prevent damage to the window. Um, there's quite a lot of water protection given to the to, to the window, so so the layers are bound together at the edges with a with a Z seal, called that because of its shape, uh, sealant and a pressure seal to, to to keep water out. The reason why it's it's treated so seriously, uh, water protection, is because any water ingression between either the either glass layer and the vinyl core can lead to delamination, because moisture expands and then contracts again as it freezes and thaws as we know from pipes in your house so any water reaching the um you know getting in will do damage and that will can lead to to a failure of the window as we'll, we'll, we'll see later also any any water reaching the, the conductive ito layer will lead to arcing because uh, obviously there's you know electrics flowing through the uh, the windows as well Impact protection, um, so bird impact or, or, or fail-safe pressure loads are, are transferred from the, the vinyl interlayer to the window installation fasteners via this thin metal insert around the, the, the periphery of the, the window, which, which I've highlighted there as the, the, the sort of red rectangle. Um, the design of that was changed in 2006 to, to prevent vinyl interlayer cracks, and it, it, it now extends further into the laminate and, and, and has been moved further outboard as well. Um, I said there was a lot of changes to, to windows in, in 2005, 2006, and, um, 
uh, you know, eyebrow window removals, the redesign of these, um, that the QRH procedures were, were, were changed, the whole whole lot of stuff, which uh, again you, you, I will cover. The eyebrow windows, uh, so that that's that's how they look. You've got number four on the top and the and the different number five on the, the bottom. So whereas the number one and two windows have got a conductive coating between the outer glass panes and the vinyl core, where it's most effective for, for anti-icing, the eyebrow windows and number three, if it's, uh, if it's heated as well, they've got the conductive coating between the inner glass pane and the vinyl core, where it's most effective for defogging. So if if you think about it, the ice, icing occurs on the outside of the window. Um, fogging occurs on the inside of the window. So you you put the, um, the the ITO layer closest to the one that's going to be most effective affected, uh, or where it, where it most needs to be. So for the for the front windows, uh, it's it's for de-icing because you need to see out. Um, for the eyebrow windows, it's it's just defogging. So that's that's the logic there. Okay, the hydrophobic coating. Uh, mentioned this already, but just for those of you that weren't on flying the seven three as long as uh, as I have, um, we used to have this behind the the captain's seat. That that little um, canister. And that was rain repellent. Uh, it was only ever on the originals and the classics, and uh, it, it was removed during the life of the classics, actually, although the buttons remained. Um, and these two uh, buttons were, were just a, above the wiper controls, and they, they basically gave a shot of this rain repellent onto, on, onto Windows 1, uh, left and right. The repellent was actually removed in the mid-90s due to worries about the, the environment and the health effects of breathing the fluid. Um, it, it was called Rainbow and it, it, it was a low toxicity solvent, uh, but it did contain Freon 113, which is a CFC. And of course, you know, the, uh, the environmental considerations were that, you know, if at all possible, let's not use it. Uh, there was a lot of talk about it being toxic or carcinogenic or, or what have you. That that wasn't actually the case. I mean, very low level to toxicity, but but nothing you know, nothing more than you, you'd encounter you know in in day to day life. Um, these canisters had uh, had been known to leak, and in '91, Boeing added a solution called D um, lemonine, which is a strong smell of oil peel into it, so that if if it leaked, you would smell it and you know know that something was amiss. So as I say, since '94, all um, all Boeing aircraft have have been built with a hydrophobic coating on on window one, and this. Uh, for PPG, the, um, the the trademark name is Surface Seal, um, and they say about it: Surface Seal hydrophobic coating improves the ability of the windshield to shed water, providing the ultimate invisibility for pilots during wet conditions. Well, there you go. That's nice. Um, note that the coating does deteriorate with time, depending on wiper use. So please don't use wipers on a dry windscreen. I don't know why you would, but don't use it to flick bugs off or something like that. Um, if 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 the screen's not wet, don't use the wipers because what you will do is you will you will erode the um, the hydrophobic coating. Um, if it, it it can also be you know impacted by windscreen cleaning methods or what have you. It can be reapplied, but it, it's kind of down to you as the crew to um, to, to you know to flag it up to the engineers that it needs uh, reapplying. So, you know, if, if, it, if it is having um, a significant effect on, on your forward visibility, the, 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 you know, the lack of a hydrophobic coating, then put it in the tech log and the engineers will, um, will, will put it in the calendar to, um, to, to reapply it. Boeing's uh, stance on this, by the way, is, is that the windshield wipers alone supply a sufficient quantity of rain removal without a, a secondary rain repellent system. And by that, they mean either uh, a hydrophobic coating or the old fashioned um, uh, rain repellent juice that got squirted onto the windscreens. So Boeing say you don't need either of those. The wipers are good enough. We know as crew it helps because for one thing, the, the wipers are blooming noisy and 
quite a distraction. Um, but anyway, there we go. Right, window heat. Um, one of the great benefits I've got in making these videos for you <laughs> is that I don't need to rigidly stick to the ATA chapters. Window heat actually falls under ice and rain, and as I'm sure you're aware, I've done an ice and rain video. Um, but I don't f feel that you can really talk about windows without talking about window heat. So I'm, I'm actually going to go into it in much more detail here than I did in the ice and rain section, because obviously ice and rain I was covering other things as well. So, uh, the temperature of the windows is regulated at 43C for Windows 1 and 2, uh, between 24 to 35 for Windows 3, if the, the, your airline has got that option, and between 32 and 43 for Windows 4 and 5, eyebrow windows, if they're installed. Um, those temperatures are actually slightly different on the classics and the originals, but I'm sure we're mostly flying NGs and Maxes these days, so they're your numbers. Um, Window heat control units, which I'll probably be referring to as WHCUs um, for the rest of this presentation, they're in the in eBay. They switch off power to Windows 1 and 2 if the temperature exceeds 62C. Um, so there we go. That's the numbers for you, for those that like numbers. Um, how does it work? So it works by passing an electric current through a conductive coating the ITO, uh, which isn't gold, in the lamina between two bus bars which run the full length along the top and bottom edge of the windows. And you can see the bus bars there in the photos. So they're the kind of, they're showing up as a kind of creamy colour in these photos. Um, and you will see at the, uh, well, looking at the top photo, the right hand end, that's your power terminal with the, 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 the sort of orange coloured. Um, terminator on on top of it and then you've got that browed braided uh power wire which you know comes all the way from the you know the electric source in the in the aircraft so there you go you've been staring through the uh, the windscreens all these hours you now <laughs> hopefully know a little bit more about what, what what's actually in your field of vision there which you know is all part of why i you know try and do these just Keep things interesting. Um, interestingly, the bus bars are actually on the, the forward and aft edges for, for Windows 2, the, the opening DV window. Uh, there are top and bottom edges for the other window. Also visible, um, if you look down to the bottom of, of Window 1 or down to the bottom of Window 2, are these things. You, you've probably seen them a thousand times. Um, may or may not have wondered what they are. They're temperature sensors. And there are two of them, uh, so you've got a backup. Uh, they're resistance type temperature sensors, uh, hence why they've got lots of little zigzaggy lines. Looks a bit like the heated window in, the, in maybe a, a, a car rear window, uh, only much, much finer. That, that's the resistive uh, side to it. And that resistance there uh, is for feedback to the window heat control units. Um, as the resistance of the of the wire is temperature sensitive, any change in window temperature will cause a change in in the the resistance of the sensor. That is fed back to the the WHCUs to to maintain a steady window temperature of your, of forty three degrees. So that's how it does it, um, and and that's significant that these windows are held at forty three C. They don't bounce, you know, up down between the upper and lower limits. They're held at forty three. So as we've said, there are there are two sensors in each of windows one and two, a primary and a spare, and the active sensor changes every time you cycle window heat on and off, which obviously happens in the, the cockpit preparation. Worth remembering this, and I'll uh, I'll come on to tell you why. These are the window heat control units. They are in the in eBay. Um, there's a pair of them in. Most aircraft you'd be flying now. Previously, there used to be four, um, and uh, they control either one left and two right, or the other one, one right and two left. And and the reason for that is is redundancy. What you don't want is um, one window heat control unit, say, controlling both windows one, because if the unit were to fail then you would lose forward vision on both windows. So it's it's redundancy. So you, you, you've got two separate ones of these in the E and eBay, one doing 
the captain's front window and the other doing the FO's front window and you know backing up with the opposite sides as well and you, you see this when when you you know when you get an engine failure you know in the sim um, and you look up at the pattern of lights you know before the APU's come on um, that that sort of diagonal pattern of, of, of amber master cautions you will see alternating the um, the, the, the the window heat um, Anyhow, the, these, as I say, control power to the windows. They also monitor the window temperatures, as previously discussed, and control the uh, the on or off and overheat indications. The power for, for heat control, as I say, it's not just the binary on off. The window resistance is measured at power up, and the window control unit adjusts that power up with a ramp up function to prevent thermal shock to, to the window. And again, you, you'll have seen this in the house. I mean, how many times does a does a light bulb blow when you switch it on? Um, it, it, they never blow when they're already on, or very rarely. They mostly blow when you switch it on. And that's that initial um, burst of power to a, to a cold unit. Um, that 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 causes that that failure from the you know from the the, the, the thermal shock. The, this is a similar thing here. So it ramps up gently as it gets near its target temperature. It ramps down again to prevent overshoot, and then sends the necessary current you know from the feedback from that resistive type temperature sensor to to hold a steady 43C. That's how they work. Um, this is a sort of close up of the of the, the uh of the fascia and you can see it that these have got uh bite test built in test equipment functions and fault lights that will illuminate if there are faults in either the 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 unit itself the you know the LRU we're, we're looking at here the window heat panel the temperature sensors or their power sources so any one of those things um can can flag up one of those uh red lights there um I've only listed four, there are five in there, that's because there are, there's one for each sensor. And there's two rows then because it's 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 window one or window two on this, this particular box. The uh, the latest ones from 2016 onwards, as is depicted here, can also put a window into single sensor, dual sensor or override mode, which I'll come on to uh, explain. The older ones look like this. Um, so the sort of, Pre 1990s were, were were just dumb boxes and didn't have any uh, bite facility at all. The uh, from oh when was it late 90s uh, early early noughties we went to these boxes uh, which have got a bite test facility in them. Um, but there's one for each window, so one left, one right, two left, two right have all got their own box. But as I say, in 2016 it it changed to this dual. WHCU arrangement. Right now, let's talk about temperature sensor failures. As I've mentioned, that the, there are two sensors: the, 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 the sort of active one and a, and, a, and, a, and a backup. Now, if the active overheat sensor fails, the uh, the window heat control unit commands the overheat light to illuminate, even though there isn't an overheat condition. Why? Because that's the only way it can talk to us. That, that that's the only light it's got any control over, uh, so it flags it up. It, it you know it's it's a bit akin to the PSEU. You know it's one light. You know it's a kind of multi-function light. Uh, I mean it mostly means overheat, but you know it can be telling you something else. Now we as crew don't know this, um, um you know we don't need to know that. Um, and I'll I'll come on to tell you why now. Um, so the fix, if you recall. Uh, I said that the, the active sensor is changed, it flip flops each time the the window heat, the associated window heat is switched on and off. So the fix is to cycle the associated window heat switch on and off, and that assumes that 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 switches the other sensor to be the act the the the, uh, the active one, assuming it's working okay, and that will make the overheat light extinguish because the act the new active sensor is working. So your overheat light disappears. Great. Engineers know that. We as crew didn't know that, but we kind of don't need to know that because our QRH procedures cover this. Because with an overheat light, we are directed to switch the window heat off for two to five minutes and then switch it back on. Now we, of course, all just assumed it was to let the window cool down, and it is. 
if it was a genuine overheat. But if what had happened was that it was a sensor had failed, you actually wouldn't have had to have waited two to five minutes, but you'd do it anyway because you'd be following the QRH procedure. When you switch it back on, the condition goes. And that either could be because the overheat has gone, if it was an overheat, or because it's flipped across to the new sensor, which, which is a, the working sensor. So it's it's one of those, you know, that, that you know, as crew we won't have considered before, but it, it may just be worth putting it in the tech log or flagging it up to uh, to engineering if you have an overheat in flight, um, because it may just have been an overheat solved by the uh, by the QRH procedure, or it may be you've had a sensor fail, and the next time that's going to come and bite you is the next time you do your cockpit preparation, and you put the window heat on again, and you get an overheat that you can't, that you know that that, that makes no sense because you're on the ground. All right, I mentioned override mode. Let's let's just have a look at that. So, following an in-flight temperature sensor failure and the QRH window overheat procedure, at the next window heat cycle, which again is during the pre-flight procedure, the window heat control unit will switch back to the failed one, and that'll give you an overheat light again. So you've then got a problem. I mean, you could just switch it again, you know, but really, it, it, you, you know there's something wrong now. Um, so you flag it up to engineer, engineer comes out, says, what's the problem? Goes and sticks his head in the in eBay, and there will be staring him in the face a red light on one of the window heat control units on either sensor one or sensor two of whichever was the affected window. So he can see that instantly because he's got this red light in front of him. He says, right, OK, we haven't got a spare window in the in the hangar. We haven't got time to do it now or whatever the, the, the reason might be. I need to dispatch you. What I'll do, I'll put the window heat control unit into override mode. And this prevents any further alternating between the working sensor and the fail sensor so that only the working sensor will be active. And to do it, well, I mean, the engineers will know this, you basically push the associated pair of white switches up at the top there that, that are marked, left pair for window 1, right pair for window 2. The green override mode light comes on, as shown in the picture. And engineers put it in the tech log, and they'll, um, they'll get the windshield replaced at the, at the next available opportunity. So that's how, how that one's got round. Electrical power. So the uh, the wind heat system it uses 115 volts AC as you would expect because it's you know quite a, a beefy electrical load from transfer bus one and two for the window heat control units. The newer dual wind heat control units, you, you know your post 2016 ones, they've got internal transformers with auto adjustable taps to control the voltage for window heat power. On older ones, each window heat control unit had to be calibrated for the resistance of the individual window. So when the window came from PPG, it actually had a code on it with, which was, was its resistance value and you would match that up with the, uh, or you, you, you put that into the, um, uh, you know, in, in, into the system so, so that it, 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 the window heat control unit knew what resistance of window it was dealing with. Now say so all that's gone now, it's, it's all, you know, all automatic, which is nice. The window heat circuit breakers are mostly at the bottom of the P6 panel. Um, the area is now called P65 on the Max. It used to be known as P611 and 12 on the NGs and the Classics, and that division kind of gave a clue as to where the power came from. Um, P611 is from Jenny 2 and P612 is from Jenny 1. So that is why the pair of CVs are separated, because they're drawing from a different generator power source. Aircraft which had four window heat control units, so the pre-2016 ones, also had a control circuit breaker for each uh, each unit on the P18 panel, that the P18-3, so it's sort of down toward the bottom, and you, I've I've marked them on there. Um, they were removed with two with the with the dual WHCU aircraft. So again, you you, you know if you. <laughs> If you're that way inclined, when you get on the flight deck, you can you can just look behind the captain's seat, see well, how many window heat. If you've got the window heat control uh, circuit breakers, and and instantly get a, a feel for the age of the aircraft, whether it's a pre-2016 or not. I mean, it is possible it's been retrofitted, but not many folk tend to do that. 
all aircraft, four or two uh, WACUs have got a, uh, a right front, left side, right side and left front window heat power circuit breaker, as uh, shown in the photos there. Um, if your aircraft's got heated number three or eyebrow windows still installed, then the extra circuit breaker will be in that space to the left of the other two. Um, so you've got the, well, the NG there, and the, 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 so NG on the right and Max on the left. Uh, these are what eyebrow window CVs would 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 look like. Yeah, again, just for for way of example, so and you know explanation. So that spare left slot there uh, on on the, the the upper example, that's an aircraft with eyebrow windows and no window th three heat because it it would actually say L three, L four, and L five. And the bottom one, it's in opt because the eyebrow windows have been removed. So window three heat, we, we've we've already spoken a bit about it. As as I've said, that there's an option for it to be heated. If it is heated, it requires a different window um, to to be installed in the aircraft. So the, the window three, the, the the standard, is a dual plane stretched acrylic. Remember, stretched acrylic because it, it it's stronger, but it is more prone to crazing. Um, with a laminated glass window, uh, with with the integral electric heating, is 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 what you would have with with the heating option, and the construction of that is very similar to Windows One and Two. The heat control for this is by the left and right number two window heat side switches on the overhead panel, um, and that, according to Boeing. The, the option enhances the comfort of the flight crew by providing warm windows next to the flight crew seats. Well, you know, I I, I can hear the engineers, you know, <laughs> for thoughts on that from here. But trust me, if you're on a long night flight, it gets blooming cold in the flight deck. It really does. Um, and and it, it's, you notice it whether you've got a heated number three or not. Um, it, it, Trust me, it's it's welcome. Not so much on day because you got you know, obviously the the solar heating from the sun. But on a long night flight, uh, you do miss not having a heated window three. Um, now, windows three, four, and five. So this back side window and the the the, the two eyebrow windows, they don't have window heat control units. And, and temperature sensors. Instead, they've got simple on-off thermal switches, and there's one up, sort of highlighted in the photo there. They're temperature sensitive, biometallic, single pole, snap action switches with normally closed contact points. So it's just like a thermostat in a house or, you know, or what have you, you know, it, it, it's either on or off. That's it. They, they, for window three, the switch opens at 35 centigrade and it closes at 24 centigrade. So, so the temperature is constantly cycling between the two, depending on whether window heat is being applied or not applied. Unlike windows one and two, which, as I say, is a, is is a constant control level of window heat to to, to or current, sorry, to to give a uniform heat. So one way to tell whether you've got the heated window three option is just look for that small round unit at the bottom of the window. That's your thermal switch and you'll only find it on aircraft with heated windows. Perhaps a more obvious way to tell if you've got heated window three option is, is by observing the way that the window, if unheated, can fog up after landing. And it, it, it can be more than an annoyance. It, 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 if if you're taxiing and you've got the window fogged up like that obviously most of the time you're taxiing forwards but if you, if you have to make a 90 degree turn or turning on to stand or something like that and you're trying to see you know what's what's around there um it it, it just makes life a little a little more tricky so um much better if airlines choose to have the uh, the heated window 3 option um the that round unit is also visible on uh, window five, not on window four because the uh, the thermal switch on window five also manages uh, the the window heat for for window four as well. So you've got one thermal switch covering both eyebrow windows, and another thermal switch 
for window 3 if fitted. Um, as you can see on this photo, this aircraft has not got a heated window 3 because there's no thermal switch at the bottom of it. You, you would see it from the outside as well. Um, out of interest, these the eyebrow windows run about 8 degrees hotter than uh, window 3. Contact points on window 5. Um, thermal switch open at 43 and close at 32. So that, that I'd say, is for, it's both windows 4 and 5 as well. So let's talk about overheat lights. Again, we've already mentioned the uh, the sensor failure, but, but let's, you know, uh, talk about the more conventional side of it. So if, a, if an overheat light illuminates either window 1 or window 2 as overheated, I got to 63C, or electrical power to the window has been interrupted, or a sensor has failed. The affected window heat must be switched off, allowed two to five minutes to cool before switching on again. That's in accordance with QRH and FCOM procedures. Again, let me just spell it out because I, the, the, there is, you know, confusion for those who are new on type or you know what 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 have you. But there is no overheat indication or protection for Windows 3, 4 or 5. They are not part of the anti-ice panel indication or test systems. The only connection with the anti-ice panel on Windows 3, 4 and 5 is that you switch them on and off with the left and right side window heat switches respectively, along with Window 2. So the forward switch does only Window 1. The side switches do Window 2, 3 if you've got it heated, four and five if you've got eyebrows. Right, the overheat switch. Um, probably don't use this very often, but it's it, it, it's there for us to use. It's, uh, I think it's in the supplementary procedures and it's used to simulate an overheat condition. So to check the function of the overheat switch, what, what you do is you put all the window heat switches on, then move the test switch up to the overheat position and all the overheat lights should illuminate. To extinguish those overheat lights you cycle the window heat off then on. Obviously if it's if it's a test you don't need to wait two to five minutes because it wasn't a real overheat it's a simulation of an overheat condition. Let me talk to you about FCOM Bulletin. Uh, it may not have the same numbering in your airline. This is TBC, which is the Boeing company. Um, so if, if if you don't have the same number of bulletins as you know there were, then yours might be numbered differently. But it will still have the same title. Um, this came into effect in 2016, soon after the uh, the introduction of the dual window heat control unit, and it mostly explains the the new behavior of the window heat and master caution captions during a, um, a sort of three second initialization self-test routine which starts automatically when you switch window heat on. At the end of this bulletin, and it's a six page bulletin, uh, but at the end of it it's got this very small footnote and it says for illumination of the amber window overheat lights following electrical power transfers the crew should cycle electrical power to the affected window by completing the above window overheat non-normal checklist. So why should the overheat light come on during an electrical power transfer? The the reason, and, it, and this is not unique to the window heat control units, this is unique, th 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 this applies to any uh, any box, any computer, any any component in the in eBay pretty much. And, uh, and a lot of avionics, you know, on, on the flight deck as well. Power transfers can cause very short electrical er interruptions in, in equipment. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking, you know, tenths or, or, or hundreds of a second. Um, and in, in doing so, you, you have to understand the construction of the components. They contain a lot of electronics, as, as we know, but in electronics that there are both resistive and capacitive uh, components. And capacitive components keep hold of charge for a, a, a finite amount of time. Um, if they keep their charge longer than the electrical power interruption, then whilst the rest of the box is switched on and off, this thing never, the, the, the capacitive component never switched off 
and you, you, you've got a mismatch in the startup routine of the, of the component. Things have to be started up in a certain way with with anything computery, um, and if you if if you, if you interrupt that or do it do it in a sequence it's not used to, then you know bad things can happen. So what we're doing here is uh, we're switching it off, waiting for <laughs> two to five minutes. That's why it says you know do it in the in the non-normal chat. I mean it. it probably hugely excessive but this is what Boeing says so this is what you have to do um, and then switch them back on again and that gives it a time the, the the box is time to shut down and restart again correctly so that that's that's what that's all about okay now the the same switch for overheat if moved down becomes a power test switch so if window heat is switched on but the on light is extinguished as in this photo example here that means that heat isn't being applied to the associated window and that could be because the heat controller is detected that the window is becoming overheated which is normal on a hot day in direct sunlight it hasn't been overheated yet otherwise the overheat light would be on but it's becoming overheated and you can verify this well either by you know by touching the window and if it's <laughs> if it feels hotter than usual then that's probably what's going on the heat will be automatically restored when the window is cooled down and say so normally the, the, this shouldn't happen you know the, it, it uses the you know those temperature sensors and you know gives the correct amount of current but if it's you know if the sun's beaming down on it, it, it you know it might just have to withdraw the current altogether just to keep it within limits to stop it from overheating and that's what's going on here so the power test switch, what's that all about? Well, it's it's a confidence check for us as crew to confirm that the window heat is still available. And, you know, you wouldn't want to take off thinking, well, it, it might not come on. <laughs> so what you do is you just blip the power switch test down and that will illuminate all on lights, assuming the window heat switches are on. Uh, and that forces the temperature controller to full power. Overheat protection is still available, um, but again note note what i'm saying here it forces the temperature controller to full power so don't keep your thumb on the power test for any longer than necessary you hold it for a fraction of a second until the the green on lights come on then you release it it's it's spring loaded to the center you know for for, for this purpose but you don't want to be you know keep forcing it otherwise you'll drive it to an overheat condition Okay, the um, not all window heat panels look like those I've shown. Um, there is a dark cockpit option, and with this option, the green on lights, which are normally on all flight, um, burning a hole in our retinas on those long night flights, uh, are replaced by amber off lights, which only illuminate if the window heat is off. And this uh, means in normal flights, all the lights are off. Dark cockpit concept. Really, this, you know, is is the way forward. This is kind of how it should be. Um, if uh, if Boeing had their thinking hats on back in the 60s, they'd have done it this way in the first place. But anyway, we've got it now. It's it's still oddly enough only optional. Um, I guess that's for fleet commonality. Um, I imagine. I, I I don't know. You you would have thought they would have made it standard with the Max, but there you go. They didn't. Limitations. Uh, there are two of these in the procedures. In the uh, the normal procedures, it, it says, and just a reminder, yeah, that uh, window heat switches should be on at least ten minutes before takeoff. Um, that's a you know an, an often forgotten limitation. Um, I say it, it. You could argue that unless icing conditions are there, what does it matter? Uh, and I would come right back at you and say well don't forget window heat's also there for the strength of the window and you might have a bird strike on takeoff if you do your windows won't be at maximum strength um, so you know try not to forget this this uh, th this limitation uh, the other one is that um, if any on, on light is extinguished, then um, then you've got no heat to that window. 
observe the maximum air speed limit of 250 below 10. And again, this is for bird strike protection. I mean, that's a maximum air speed limit. Personally, if it was me, and if it was, you know, daylight when birds are flying, I'd be right back, you know, down at, um, you know, the, 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 the slowest speed I could. Right, fringe patterns. What, you may ask, are they? Um, well, it's not Spock's great haircut, um, nor nor any other celebs uh, celebrity fringe. It's actually the the fringe pattern I'm talking about is that in the bottom left corner of this image. Um, that is an interference pattern, fringe pattern, what you know, phys physicists call them, um, and we see these in aircraft windows. There we go, just looking at the photos on the right hand side of the screen for a moment, you've got the 737 at the top, they're a bit faint on that photo, I couldn't find a particularly good one in, in, in my library. Uh, A320 showing up very colourful there in the middle, and at the bottom that's a 777. So when viewed under certain conditions, um, and this is especially true if wearing Polaroid lens sunglasses, which uh, is why we as, as air crew shouldn't wear Polaroid lens sunglasses because they work by allowing through light which has been polarized in one particular plane. So any reflected light is polarized and that can be reflected off uh, water, off cloud tops, probably off the, uh, the glare sheet panel actually in front of the windows. Um, but really Polaroids should be avoided in, in, in flying. Google Brewster's Law if you want to read up more about this. Um, but anywho, uh, th these photos, I, I, I didn't take you through a Polaroid lens. Uh, you can see them without a pol you, having your Polaroid sunnies on, um, if the conditions are right. Uh, oddly enough, I usually find a cloudy day is better, but the only, that's probably because of the, the polarizing effect of cloud. Um, and you see these colors, known as fringes, uh, and you get the same effect with water drops on, uh, with oil drops on water, or in soap bubbles. Um, Effects also known as thin film interference. That that's the effect that creates these um, the, the, these fringes. So it's a it's a natural phenomenon in which light waves reflected by the upper and lower boundaries of a thin film, and the thin film we're talking about here is the ITO conductive heating layer, interfere with one another, and that interference. Um, comes about because of the, as I say, the, these microscopic differences in the thickness of that thin layer. They, you, you've got one, uh, imagine two photons of light. One, one hits the, uh, the outer layer of the ITO and is reflected back towards your eye. The, the second photon hits the, the back layer of the, of the ITO which might be a fraction of a wavelength further away and then is reflected back off that and comes towards you right the, the two things are so close in 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 terms you know as I say fractions of a, of a wavelength they interfere uh, they, they they the the waves kind of overlap and you know sort of grow shrink what 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 have you they um and and that causes the color so where you see areas of the same colour, you know that, that there's the same re reflected path. Um, and, you know, where it's different colours, obviously, there's different reflected path. The reflected path is the thickness of that layer. So that's where the different, where the, the different colours come from. The fringe pattern is, interestingly, it's always the same on the 737, and I, I, I would imagine it's always the same on the 320 and on the triple, and, and on every other type of airliner. But I, I've, I've been through my photo library of hundreds of these, um, and it dawned on me, it, it's always the same, which is perhaps unexpected when you think that it comes about because of a slight difference in thickness that, that you would have thought was perhaps a manufacturing, ah, don't want to say defect, um, just a function of the way it's manufactured, or indeed fastened to the uh, the window. But um, but anyhow, it's it's always the same, and and these are the patterns. So window one's always got an oversized circle centered just slightly above the centre of the windscreen. Um, 
window two has always got a horizontal line just over halfway up the window and window three when heated i so say the unheated ones you can see doesn't have the fringe pattern um, but when heated it's got a diagonal line that runs from the uh, the top half corner to the bottom forward corner um, it's always the same pattern so I so say next time you're doing your walk around have a, have a look um, in fact you don't need to be doing a walk around this was um, somebody who taxied past me saw the fringe and thought gotta get a photo of that um, it, it, that window number three is showing the characteristic diagonal line of rainbow colour on window three and that tells you it's got the heated window three option and the, 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 the confirmation of that is the visibility of the thermal switch that small white circle at the bottom of, of that window and you can also see it on the on um oh, i've labeled it as window four sorry window five my bad the um the eyebrow window so um yeah there you go um things you can look out for next time you're taxiing around the um to the holding point window two let's uh, let's talk about that and how it's different to the other windows it opens that's the big difference. Um, both the captain's and the FO's window too can be opened from the inside for ventilation, direct vision, ground communication, or for use as emergency exits, or for passing fuel receipts up, or de-icing receipts, or throwing down tech log pages that you've forgotten to hand to the dispatcher. Whatever it might be, um, there's there's all there's a, many uses for an opening window. Um, However, to close it, uh, you do have to pull the latch first. If you, do, if you don't pull that lever, uh, you can't close it. And <laughs> please, any trainers watching this video, do make sure you cover this with your, um, with your students on line training. Because uh, it's not something you can practice in the simulator. Because uh, those windows don't open. Um, and if, uh, if your poor FO you know, hasn't been shown how to close a DV window, he he just won't know. He'll never remember this off ground school. Uh, he'll uh, he, he, it could end up in an embarrassing situation for him when he's out online and can't close his own window. So there we go. Have a heart. Um, so why do we have that latch? Without it, the window would simply slide downwards. Which, if your aircraft's in one of these two positions, uh, would be to the closed position in the event of well. A nose gear collapse or, or other nose down event and that would impede evacuation which is probably the most pressing need um, direct vision communication smoke ventilation whatever it might be from the flight deck now uh, these photos are just ones I you know I, I, I found online the I mean the most dramatic one on the on the right there it looks like the DV windows are closed I mean, whether they were during the event or not, I, I do not know. Um, but certainly the Piedmont aircraft, though, which, uh, whilst it's at a less dramatic angle, you can see that the, the FO's DV window is open. The I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I can see something white coming from it, whether that's the escape rope or not, I don't know. Um, but that would only stay open thanks to the latch. Um, so you can see it, you know, this this is why the, the 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 latch exists. Now we know they can be open from the inside, but in addition to that, window number two on the FO side can also be open from the outside, and that's to allow emergency access to the flight deck. So if you're inside incapacitated after an event, then the fire team or whoever can 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 open that window and get you out. On some, but not all, cargo 737s, the captain's window can also be opened from the outside. And the logic for that was that um, following an accident, access to the flight deck from the cabin would be impossible because of a, uh, or you know, could be impossible because of a shift in main deck cargo. So external access had to be assured. Um, quick note about cable damage. Um, do take care when opening the number two window not to damage any uh, EFB charging cables or you know what have you. There was a similar problem um, 
oh many years ago with the with the window heat wiring cables that that came out of the back of window uh two but that was addressed with uh with a design change in in two thousand and seven so just you know watch the cables and things as you as you open that window so um there is unfortunately a history of window number two opening during the takeoff run or shortly after takeoff um now in 2002 Boeing identified that the main contributor to this was incorrect factory rigging however um, the second contributor was that the window had not been locked prior to to take off and this led to the introduction of a step in the before start checklist to check that the window is fully closed and locked before each flight now having had one such event um, I mean we didn't get airborne like that but but it happened on the takeoff roll and I managed to hear the noise before the window sprung open and tell the FO close your window which he, he, he did and closed and locked it. Um, it it's quite a distraction you know it's well we were we were certainly above 100 knots I think but below V V V one um, having had an event like that you know if you if you haven't had it you, you, you're lucky um, but I can assure you that this check is well worth doing, especially, certainly in Europe, some countries require the, uh, the on the FO side, the window two to be open during refueling operations. So, you know, and th this is a recent thing that, that that's happened over the last five years or so. Um, you know, the, the refuelers want ground communication with the, uh, with the flight deck, you know, particularly during the boarding of passengers. So, the window gets opened more these days than it used to, which means there's more of an opportunity for it to not get closed properly, you know, closed and, and, and locked. So personally, when I'm doing this check, I actually give it a tap uh, forwards just to make sure it's locked. The, uh, there is a QRH procedure for, for window open, um, and it starts by instructing you to fly as slow as safely possible for your flap setting. That reduces air loads, uh, which are pushing on the window to, and, and hence pushing it backwards, i.e. to the open position. Because whilst it, it does look mostly to the slide, it is at an angle and there is a forward component of, um, you know, the, the, to it as well. So, so for any forward airflow will, will push that window open. Uh, which of course is why it comes open during the takeoff roll. If you're having difficulty closing or locking the window, you may want to consider reducing speed further with, with you know, with with flap. Now, Boeing say the window, the, sorry, the aircraft can be flown safely with the window open, which is true. But uh, again, whilst I've never done it, uh, I can imagine it it would be a huge distraction and extremely noisy. Um. Boeing actually produced an instructional video on this. Uh, Ray Craig did it, the chief test pilot uh, of the 73 at the time, and he said, well, the, the, the elements I took out of it are as follows. First off, there's nothing mechanically wrong with the aircraft. Second, following on from that, it's much better to continue than to attempt a high-speed rejected takeoff. Third, the correct decision is to continue the takeoff get to a safe altitude, then close the window. And finally, always remember that the aircraft can fly and land just fine with the, with the window open. I'm not saying you'll enjoy the experience, but it can be done. So, you know, especially with, you know, get the autopilot in, you know, de-stress de yourself and um, re reduce speed. If you see if you can close it, if you can't, come back round, circuit and land. that certainly got my attention, but it didn't necessarily require immediate action on the part of the flight crew. Consider this, there's nothing mechanically wrong with the airplane. It's ready to fly. At this point, it's much safer to continue than it is to attempt a high-speed rejected takeoff.
The correct decision is to continue the takeoff, get to a safe altitude, and close the window. If the window has been damaged and will not close, you can still declare an emergency and return to the airport. The airplane can fly and land just fine with the window open. Okay, some visors <laughs> from, from one extreme to the other. Um, windows 1 and 2 have got a movable plastic sunscreen. Uh, it's stowed in the sidewall down by your, uh, your leg there, and it's attached to a rail that covers windows 1 and 2 on each side using a release lock lever. The, uh, the back of the visor actually shows the action of the, uh, of the release lock lever as, as it grabs both the top and the bottom of the rail. So two things happen when you move that lever, as, as you can see there in those, uh, those before and after photos. Um, there's an option for Windows 2 and 3 uh, to, to have uh, film sun visors as well. Um, you, you, you'll know that because you'll see hooks on to, to, to latch onto on the uh, on the pillars. Very nice option to have. Um, right, that's that's enough of visors. Okay, window problems. Let's uh, let's see what we got here. Um, this photo is a photo I took uh, in January 1995. I hadn't been on the 737 very long at all. I was still in the right hand seat, so this I got a great view of this happening. Um, we were we were climbing um, and passing about 33,000 feet from memory. We suddenly noticed a bit of sparking at the top of my windscreen. Um, the captain quite quickly called me to switch the window heat off and in the seconds it took for him to get the words out me to take my eyes off this light show in front of me find the window heat and switch it off it had gone and it went with a bang that was like a gunshot going off really 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 loud um, and the window shattered this photo doesn't do it justice and I've got some more which I'll show you um, the, the 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 whole screen you 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 could not see through it, um, so there you go. It 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 it, it can and does happen. Um, now, what I want to say here is that the stats show that the outer pane is the one most likely to fail, and this was an outer pane that failed in my case. It is not a big problem, as it's non-structural. Remember the construction. All the loads. Well, is, is primarily held by the inner pane and secondary uh, uh, the fail safe is, is the is the is the middle acrylic the outer it, it it's just to stop the window getting chipped um, so if it's that one that, that goes no biggie at all 
Uh, that's not to say it's not dramatic, alarming, uh, distracting, um, and in fact we chose to to divert when when it happened. Uh, to well, the captain chose to divert, and, and you know I was <laughs> I, I was quite happy to go along with with his shout on that. Um, the 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 biggest problem is that you can't see through it. Well, this wasn't a problem in this case because it was the FO's window, which was me. Uh, so the captain had a had an had an absolutely fine view. But uh, there could be circumstances, you know, if in if in in poor weather where where that's an issue. In which case, you might want to consider an autoland. But anywho, um, due to the construction. It is extremely rare for a window to fail completely or separate from a frame. I do not know of an example in the say in the fifty odd years of the seven three seven where a window has completely uh, come away. The only example I'm aware of which got close to it was this one in the photo, which was of a seven three seven NG uh, in two thousand and five, which had this partial separation of an eyebrow window. Uh, climbing through twelve and a half thousand feet, and the aircraft it got no worse than you see in that photo. Uh, I, I would imagine it was a bit loud and noisy, and you know, pressurisation would, would would have been an issue. Uh, but they landed, they landed safely. Uh, again, note the date. This was two thousand and five. This was the same year that eyebrow windows were removed. Uh, which, as I say, I don't think is a coincidence. And the investigation had shown that the uh, the inner structural glass ply had fractured due to peel chip. And I will come on and show you examples of peel chip, but probably no better example than, than that there in that photo. Although it's, it's hard to see which bit is the peel chip in there. But... This is a typical event, so this is not my. This is just one. I think this was reported this year. Um, I, I, I got this somewhere off uh, off the internet and I should say this photo is not from this event that's just a, a representative photo so the Canadian TSB reported that the crew observed arcing at the, the, the R1 window followed by a window overheat master caution whilst en route at flight level 360 the crew worked a related checklist however the windscreen started to crack a large crack developed the crew worked the, the forward window damage checklist and request a lower altitude the, the window continued to crack and the crew therefore declared pan pan and diverted so there you go it's pretty much exactly what happened to me back in the the early 90s and what has happened to dozens of crew since um hopefully you seeing this and seeing what it's like and me describing it you know will take away some of the element of surprise when it happens to you i say it's very loud it's quite distracting but it's it's no biggie you know a, a as long as you know it's not the inner pain, and you know statistically it won't be, just you know run a pen across the uh, the inside of the window, and if it and if it feels smooth, you know it's not the inner pain, then you know you're good to go, and it's you know it's your shout whether you whether you divert or not or, or what you do, but um, there you go. That's uh, hopefully forewarned is forearmed. Now other causes, I mean the the, the two we've spoken about were, were due to arcing, electrical arcing, which which is probably I, th I think the most common reason for, for window failures but other causes can include bird strikes or severe hail encounter as as shown in this example I mean this is a real beaten up aircraft this particular event happened uh, on departure from Geneva um, and uh, it, it occurred just going over the uh, the Jura Ridge um, so the 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 radome's beaten up and um, the, the 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 one right window is you know took a, a pummeling as well but again only the, the non-structural outer pain so arcing uh, let's let's talk more about that it's it's an electrical arc is a discharge or a short circuit across a discontinuity in a wire bus bar you know probably this case conductive heating film or other internal window components um, they usually occur near the window bus the, the, I would have thought they always occur near the window bus, but um, any, the, the the guidance I got from the uh, the maintenance manual was that they occur near the window bus uh, bus bars. They're typically the result of moisture ingress. That's a thing. So again, we spoke about the construction of the windows and why mo moisture ingress you know is necessary to prevent it. This is what it can lead to, which of course can lead to you know a window failure. 
left. And the heat from the arc can cause uh, dark brown or black burn marks on the on the bus bar and in the interlayer. And it's also possible to see small bubbles in the interlayer at the location of an arc. And I, I will show you some uh, some photos giving those telltale symptoms uh, in a second. If the arcing is left to continue, the, the localised overheating can, usually will, cause the windscreen to crack. And this is another example of, uh, of a cracked windscreen uh, from arcing. Uh, as is this. Uh, so, and, and again, th these, by the way, aren't, aren't my photos. Um, I did an appeal on the, the 737 Tech Group. Uh, for photos from uh, from you, you know the the, the audience of, of of window failures, window issues you'd had, and uh, these are a, a, a selection from you. So you know, thank you to everybody who sent those in to me. Um, I'm you know I'm sure they're appreciated by by everybody else. And uh, this, I think, this is the same aircraft as the previous photo, but that that again is 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 arcing. Um, and that's how it's punched a hole in the in the outer pane. Uh, it's not just confined to window one. Window two uh, can can arc as well. But if you remember, I said that the um, the bus bars for window two are at the sides, not the top and bottom. So the arcing stems uh, or starts from the from the sides. Crazing. Okay. This is a series of very small fissures that can occur on the surface of acrylic windows. So it's only acrylic windows. On the flight deck, that basically means window three unheated version. You can't get crazing on glass because glass is much harder than acrylic. So this is it's purely a you know a, 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 an acrylic issue. Um, Crazing in this photo, which again wasn't one of mine, it was it was sent in kindly by, by by somebody. It's quite advanced, developed into scratches, and clearly interferes with the vision. So that window needs replacing. Anything w w which which interferes with you with your vision, and by that we mean more than two inches from the the perimeter of the window, and you know you find it distracting as crew, you're within your rights to flag up, and uh, and en engineers will will replace the window. Crazing, although in the other photos it looks very obvious, that's because the light was right. And I, it 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 can actually be almost invisible um, when on the ground. Um, you know, particularly if it's dark. Um, so engineers are, are are trained to look for crazing, you know, with torchlight or what have you. But here we got, you know, apron lights which are, which are illuminating it quite well. So it it shows up, you know, from certain angles in in bright light, often more noticeable when flying than on the ground. Which is why an engineer might give you a look if you write up a, a crazed window because at first glance it looks okay. Um, if you to take the engineer flying, you'd soon see what the issue was. Um, as I say, the engineers will, will will shine the torch at different angles to, to make the crazing show up, and clearly this one needs replacing. Now, what is the cause of it? <laughs> when I when I posted these photos um, on the 737 Tech Group, the, the theories that came in were, um, were were many and various. Um, from the effects of UVA or stroke UVB exposure, pressurization, particle erosion, incorrect cleaning, and some engineers were even insistent that uh, they were caused by uh, the scratches were internal caused by pilots getting their bags in and out of the uh, of the flight deck, even though the scratches are on the outside. Now, um, I did some homework, and I found this is pitch that the engineers I guess uh, service letter 56 009-B dated 3rd of January 1996 uh, and it was it was a long service letter so I'll, I'll give you the uh, I'll give you the summary here they said uh, major volcanic eruptions can inject chemicals particularly SO2 sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere SO2 reacts with water to become 
H2SO3, which is sulfurous acid, which after additional chemical reactions becomes H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. H2SO4 in contact with acrylic windows causes crazing. Uh, th this was the you know definitive answer. Um, the suspected crazing mechanism mechanism is as follows. The desiccant action of sulfuric acid draws water out of the acrylic. The exposed surface of the acrylic contracts, shrinks due to the lost water because it's dehydrated. Surface stresses are created which cause fine cracks, crazes to appear because obviously the edges are held in place. You can't you can't shrink it, you know, at the edges because it's fixed. But if the whole thing sort of dehydrates and shrinks, then you, you're going to get these little cracks appearing. That's what they're saying. Um, low water absorbency acrylic outer plane panes are more craze resistant in the first six to nine months only of intense ex exposure. Uh, but they said after that, you know, that they're pretty much the same as the others. And coated acrylic windows have since been developed. Book glass windows are the best solution. So there you go. So if you, if you want to get <laughs> the only way to get rid of crazing is to put a glass window in number three, which means a heated window, which means we get to stay warm on night flights. Yippee. So there we are. That's the definitive answer. Um, cracks. I, I couldn't find. Well, <laughs> I was to say nobody sent me a photo of a small window crack. So, you know, this is qu probably quite an extreme example. Uh, most of the time, engineers are looking for something much, much, much smaller than this. Um, anywho, crazing can develop into cracks. A crack is defined as a fissure which has a visible width and depth. Cracks in an acrylic pane uh, do not always grow to an edge in, uh, in, a w in a window and can occur as many small fissures in a pane because of the mechanism I've, I've spoken about, because it's the whole window sh shrinking as it gets dehydrated. However, glass panes don't work like that. They don't shrink and dehydrate. Cracks will always grow to an edge uh, or adjacent to, 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 to or, or adjacent crack in the window. And, and these, you know, it looks like it's come from the, uh, the bus bars. The urethane interlay, you recall that, uh, that's the bit that holds the, um, the sort of glass to the vinyl, stops the, the shattering bits coming, uh, coming into the, the, the flight deck. These, um, and this is a great photo of it here, they, 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 they appear as lots of small cracks in random directions, hence they're also referred to as crackling. Um, and, and this, if you see it, it's, it's, the, it's the urethane in, interlay which is affected always focused around the perimeter of the window and um, when they get you know fairly advanced like at the top of the window here not so much along the the aft edge as you see it in, in this photo um, they get the kind of white or yellow discoloration from associated moisture ingression which is probably what's happening up there at the top Uh, this is also moisture ingression, and it shows the the, the, the the classic characteristic cloudy white or yellow haze within the panes, usually near the frame because it's coming from the edges where the um, where the where the, where the water is um, moisture resistant part has failed, um, and it can follow wires uh, which are internal to the window along the bus bar and also in areas of uh, delamination. Long-term exposure to, to moisture can lead to arcing, and we've seen what arcing can do. Haze. Um, this is a kind of white or light blue cloudiness uh, between the panes of glass, which, which doesn't have a distinct boundary. Um, it it, it kind of looks to me like... Um, you know, your double glazing on your on your house windows have failed. A, a, a little bit like that. It's it's most likely to appear during cold weather operation, or or, or you find it after prolonged parking or storage. Um, it'll dissipate during warm weather, but it it, it can take many hours, and, and by many hours, I mean it can take all day. Um, if the haze doesn't dissipate with window heat on the ground in 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 temperate conditions and and decreases the visual quality as in this example, then it should be replaced. 
Acrylic wafer cracks, these are common in the um, the acrylic wafers that are used to carry the sensor wire. So that, that's an enlargement of a temperature sensor. And um, and you can see the, 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 the cracks are the horizontal lines in there. The, the, the vertical lines are the temperature sensor, the, you know, the wires in the temperature sensor. The, those horizontal ones, there you're cracking. That, 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 that's what, you, what is undesirable. Uh, so usually horizontal and stacked on top of each other. If the sensor resistance indication is within limits, then it isn't necessary to replace the window. That's Boeing's advice on that. Scratches, uh, and again, I've, I've, I didn't have a particularly good photo of scratches, so I've, I've just used another crazing photo. Um, but the, it, it, it's defined as linear removal or displacement of material from the surface of the pane. A scratch with depth more than 0 0.015 of an inch or a third of a mil to the inner glass pane requires the windscreen to be replaced because it's structural. So it's the inner pane. Any damage to that at all is is by and large not acceptable. On the outer glass panes, that's fine because it's non-structural, unless of course the scratches uh, decrease the visual quality. And by that we mean it's it's within your field of vision. So it's it's within any scratches that are more than two inches in from the frame uh, would, would generally be considered um, unacceptable. Chips. Um, two types of chips. Um, I don't mean steak cut and french fries. I'm talking about the window chips. Uh, the two types are external and internal. Uh, these are defined as the removal of a material from the surface of, of a glass or acrylic pane, usually from impact with a hard object, either internal or external. This photo is um, you can see the external leading edge of the acrylic window 3 and it's got these small peel chips all the way along that leading edge uh, and that's almost certainly caused by particles carried in the airflow eroding it uh, and remember it was peel chips caused the partial separation of the of the 737 eyebrow window back in 2005 so if that's left to go uh, eventually you, you, the, the window will unseat itself from the frame. Internal chips look quite different. Um, they occur on the, the inner glass panes uh, next to the interlayer and they've got a, a rough gr sort of curved uh, gr grain shape. It's the curves which really define these um, which is why they're called peel chips and uh, th these are easily seen in reflected light. Um, so <laughs> you, you, you've got the curves and within them you, you, you've got some small white glass flakes and that's, that's the sort of chipping uh, per se and they almost always start from or, or close to the frame as in this example. Delamination, I'm sure we're probably familiar with, uh, with, with with seeing this at some point on the windscreen and, and in this example you can see the engineers have marked it with a with felt tip and, and put a date marker on it as well so that the, the, they know when it was last surveyed that's, you know, at that date that was the extent of it uh, and then they'll come back, you know, in whatever period of time and, and, and look again and measure it and if, if the delamination starts to increase rapidly then they'll take action and they'll um, and they'll replace the pain. Notice that there's um, a little bit of discoloration in there as well that brown color that's a bad sign that that means the window heat's starting to be affected as well. So it's um, w w what it is it's separation of a pane or panes from the urethane interlayer inside the window that's what's going on there. Looks like an air bubble um, and it's uh, they always seem to start from the edge um, flat, smooth, circular edge. Um, they can have an edge with smooth finger-like projections as well. You can see all sorts going on there toward the left-hand edge of this one. They can distort the vision and again like all deformities shouldn't extend more than two inches into the pane before the pane should be replaced. Personally I'd say that one should be replaced as well because I don't like the way it's turning brown. This example of delamination has, uh, has led to, to, a, to a crack that's gone all the way to the frame. So that's what can happen. 
Bubbles. Yeah, that's a thing too. Uh, looks like lots of tiny delamination. Well, it is lots of tiny delaminations. Um, small isolated or irregular shaped voids in the interlayer window, uh, internal to the window, not, not at the window edge. That, that That's probably the difference. These are things which happen you know, right in the middle of the window. If it's at the edge, it's, it, you call it delamination. If it's in the middle and they're small, you call them bubbles. Um, these ones are okay. Um, if they're right in your field of vision in, in, in window one, then you know, write it up and, and get them to change it. Uh, multiple bubbles together in a small group, um, which again is, is, is a bit uh, subjective. Um, or black or dark brown bubbles, as per the previous photo, are an indication of a damaged window heat control system and should be replaced. So these are these are probably okay as long as they're not on window one, you know, because that would be distracting. Damage limits. I mean, I've mentioned some of them as I've been going through. Um, this is an extract from the 1961 Boeing Airliner magazine. For, obviously, for precise, up-to-date criteria, engineers, please see the maintenance manual. But you know, th this is just here for the for the, for the crew, for the for the, the pilots, um, just to show you the kind of you know things the engineers are looking for. Frame cracks. So it's not only the um, the panes which can which need inspection and you know are uh, are susceptible to damage on aircraft 15 to 20 years or so um the frames start to pick up cracks and repairs must be carried out um the crack shown here is about half an inch long on the inside and three quarters of an inch long on the outside very difficult to see really the aircraft needs to, to be in for for heavy maintenance to, to to, to, to see this because obviously the window's in the way. Um, that's what the repair looks like. Uh, you, you, you've got external skin doublers there um, to you know to, to bolster the strength of the aircraft around the region of the crack. Remember this photo I showed a few slides back of the uh, acrylic window three leading edge chips. Uh, those of you with uh, with good eyesight, the observant amongst you will have spotted the crack in the in the window frame. Uh, it, and it, again, this shows how difficult it is to see. I mean, it, you know, it's visible there from the outside, but it, you know, um, I mean, spare a thought for the engineers who, who perhaps having to do this check at night when the when the light isn't so good. Um, you know, it, it really does require diligence to uh, to pick up these um, these cracks. And that's the repair for that um, that frame crack. Okay, QRH procedures. So we, we've already touched on this with the with the overheat, but let's have a look at um, at, at some other QRH procedures. Um, first off, we'll look at a QRH change which occurred in two thousand and six, um, and the the write up for this was it was for cross model standardisation. So that that's why the QRH changed back then. Specifically on the procedures, um, let's have a look at the various scenarios. So the, the, the window damage procedure, um, this you know, you, you'd use for delamination, arcing, cracked or shattered windscreen. So whatever the damage is, you come into this and you have a look and, and decide which it is. Hopefully the previous slides have helped you uh, identify and you know the difference between delamination, arcing, and you know shattered or cracked. There are two QRH procedures: one for the forward windows, which are these, one, one and two, um, and a separate procedure if you've got an unheated acrylic side window number three. So, assuming it's say window one, and you've got delamination, you know as per one of the previous photos, then continue normal operation. That's what it says. If you had arcing, then switch the affected window heat off and use windshield air for, uh, for, for fogging, for defogging, then normal operation. Like I say, this, this is the one that happened to me and many other guys as well. Uh, you will have to be pretty quick getting the window heat off. I mean, I, I don't like to do anything quickly in the flight deck. It's, it's generally not a good idea, but... Um, if you could get a wiggle on, you would, you would 
it would serve you well. And finally, if the window is cracked or shattered, then you follow the whole procedure through. So, let's have a look at that. It starts off, uh, apologies, skipped ahead there. So, so you, you're just donning the seatbelt and the shoulder harness, switching off the window heat and, and pulling the window with the windshield air controls to, to for, for, for defogging. That, that That's that's what you're doing. Um, then it asks you to choose whether the damage is on the outer or the inner pane. That can be difficult to tell. What you might want to consider is, is just running a pen or something uh, over the crack. Don't, <laughs> please don't rub your finger over the crack because um, because the sight of blood might make the captain faint. Um, so, you know, and, uh, of, of course, if if the damn thing's still arcing and sparking, you know, you, you you don't want you really don't want to be putting your fingers there. So so use something to 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 run brush along the the, the window across the, the the cracks, and if you can feel any sort of vibration coming up through the pen, then you you might have a it, it might be the inner pane. Statistically, it won't be. It's pound to a pinch. It'll be the outer. Um, but you need to know this before knowing what to do next. Because the inner pane is the main structural pane, steps one to three are preparing for a possible decompression because that could be what happens next. Your steps 14 to 16 are to reduce the differential pressure and hence reduce the pressure loads on the damaged inner pane. So hopefully you don't then get the decompression. And finally steps 17 to 19 are a recommendation to divert to the nearest suitable airport and advising not to linger below flight level 100 due to the increased risk of bird strike. A bird strike to the damaged window could cause it to fail because, well, A, it's already damaged, so it's weakened, but also B, it's it's now unheated as well. So remember, you haven't got any of that sort of malleability of the of, of the window. It, 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 it'll be cold and brittle. Um, so the last thing you need is a bird strike on it as well. I mean, that really wouldn't be your lucky day if you had a... A window failure and a bird strike, but um, but there we go. That's that's the logic with the steps. If you got damage to an unheated, so one of the acrylic side windows three, that's got its own dedicated QRH procedure. Um, arcing delamination are not considered because it's it's just not going to happen uh, because there's no conductive layer. So the procedure just goes straight for asking inner or an outer, and. It, as for the forward windows, if it's outer, then it's normal operation. If it's the inner pane, again, that's the structural one. If 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 that's the one that's that that that, that cracked or shattered, then you know you you you've got to you've got to prepare for the worst. So, um, assuming you're above nine thousand feet, the procedure splits three ways depending on your MSA, and those three options lead you to depressurize the aircraft in different ways. So, if if the MSA is below nine thousand feet, just descend um, using the slowest method. And, and you know, slowest is to uh, or, sorry, that th this is the slowest method of of um, of, de of depressurizing. If your MSA is between 9 and 13,000, use the landing altitude, landing altitude indicator to raise the cabin altitude. And if it's a, your MSA is over 13,000 feet, then manually open the outflow valve to raise the cabin altitude. Fastest method. Um, you will probably feel some discomfort on your ears, um, the, uh, you know, as will the passengers as well, um, but you really need to depressurize um, to to stop that window going through. Okay, that's enough of the flight deck windows. Um, let's quickly touch on the the passenger windows. Um, their plug type, uh, so you know, stops them popping out. Uh, by the windows are larger than the apertures. They're made by GK and Aerospace of um, of Garden Grove. Uh, and they're held in place by 10 retaining clips, as you can see in this photo um, that I took of an aircraft when it was on heavy maintenance. They've got an outer pane, a middle pane, and an inner pane. Of these, it's the outer one, which is the primary structural pane, and the middle is the, is the fail-safe secondary structural pane. So it's the opposite way around to the, um, to the flight deck windows. 
and the inner pane is only there to prevent passengers from touching the middle pane which can get cold so that's all that's for it's, you know just to keep them off um this is what it looks like well certainly as far as the the middle pane the the, the inner pane isn't shown on here um so the outer pane is made of stretched acrylic uh remember that that's for increased strength because that's the load bearing one. It's rectangular with rounded corners and a beveled outer edge to, to fit into the window frame and make it plug, plug type. The shape of the pane is curved to, also curved to align with the fuselage contour. So it's curved from top to bottom uh, because obviously the fuselage isn't flat, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's sort of oval shaped. Um, and since 1996, the outside of the outer window has been protected by an abrasion and chemical resistant coating called Crystal View. Well, Crystal View too. Um, and that gives better visibility and extends the service life, uh, giving maintenance cost reductions. And they're advertised as having a D check to G check. In other words, a seven year craze free service life. Uh, because the, a, a lot of passenger windows used to get very sort of crazed up, and, you know, the passengers were complaining, the, you know, if 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 visibility gets too bad, the engineers were having to, to swap them out. So this, you know, they 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 put this hard surface on them, and um, they reckon they got a um, you know seven year life, which is uh, much better than it used to be. Next one in is the the middle pane. Um, that sits between a seal with a with an integral stiffener ring and a metal clamping ring, and it's it's used during installation to to evenly distribute the clamping load from the from the spring clips, um, so that you don't get pinching at those you know uh, ten points. The the middle pane it's made of cast acrylic this time, so it's um, it's it's the not so strong one because this one isn't load bearing. Um, it's just secondary load bearing, but it, it gives you better transparency. Uh, it's got a shape like the outer plane, but the, the edge isn't bevel because it's holding the, 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 the seal and the, the, the clamping ring. And it, it gives the, 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 I say, the fail safe function. Um, it, it, it's certified to hold one and a half times the normal pressure load. So, you know, even though it's, it's, it's cast, it, you know, it's, it, it's not bad on strength at all. Um, all holes, you pr all uh, passenger windows, you probably notice have got a little breather hole in them. Um, that's in the middle pane, um, and it's it can be either near the bottom or the top, depending on the the age of the aircraft. Um, and that allows the air pressure in the gaps between the windows to equalise, and that ensures that the the outer pane carries the main structural load. If it wasn't there. The, the the load will be being held by the the middle pane which isn't you know how it's designed it's it, it's designed the outer one is 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 the is the main load bearing so this uh, equalizes the 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 pressurization thereby transferring the pressure loads onto that outer pane now in doing so air is going to move from you know from the gap between the inner and the middle and the middle and the outer and that air uh, will be at a different temperature and humidity to the air uh, in be, be, between the the outer and the middle and it's being forced through a small hole and again those you're familiar with physics might remember Bernoulli's um, theorem uh, about what happens to temperature when when you know when you when you force you know a gas or a liquid through it through a small hole you know it, it, it drops so you you will see some fogging or frosting near the, the the breather hole as the air makes contact with that cold outer plane and you and you've got a bit of Bernoulli going on as well now on a short flight not a problem on a longer flight, the whole window can 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 frost up, which again the passengers don't like. So from 2006 onwards, line number 2000 on on the airframes, airflow dampeners were attached over the breather hole, and these prevent the window from fogging by diffusing the air away from one concentrated point. So that's what they're about, and that that's how they work. The inner pane. Um, which I say wasn't shown on the, the breakdown before because it's it, it's 
it's not structural in, in any way, shape or form. It's, it's just made from polycarbonate. It's held in the side wall lining, you know, it's, it's sort of more there for decoration as anything else. It contains the insulation, um, so the passengers don't get cold leaning up against the, the skin of the aircraft and the blind. Um, the surround varies, but can appear either rectangular or oval, but the the middle and outer windows are always the same sort of rounded off rectangular shape, regardless of the of the shape of the cabin aperture. The overwing exit windows are pretty much identical to the normal cabin windows. Um, and, and again, that, that's a, a sort of example of, of, of one there. The door windows, uh, little portholes in the, the doors, again, very similar in construction to the passenger windows, albeit smaller. Uh, they've got an outer, middle and an inner pane, only the, the, the outer and the, the middle are structural. Uh, resistance one and a half times the normal pressure loads at 70 Fahrenheit. And the outer, again, stretched acrylic for strength. The middle one's cast acrylic for visibility and the inner is polycarbonate. So yeah, same construction as the, as the regular passenger windows. Like the cabin windows, they're plug type and held in place by clips. Miscellaneous windows. So I asked you at the start of the uh, the presentation, could anybody think of any? Let's see if you did. The downlock viewers. Okay, if you if you didn't fly the classics or the originals, I'll give you this. Um, but those of us that did, will recall that um, that that down in the cabin. Um, there are two windows to enable crew to to visually check if either the main or the or the nose landing gear is down and locked. The main the gear viewer is in the cabin, and the nose gear viewer is on the flight deck. This is a photo I took of the uh, the main gear viewer, and I say it's it's in the aisle just behind the emergency exit row above the wheel well. Uh, there are two uh, ply uh, eighth inch glass window mounted in silicon rubber seal in retainering that's secured over the upper end of the viewer tube. Uh, down in the wheel well that's the the bottom of the sort of periscope uh, thing you can see the two ply glass window at the top there that we just saw in the previous photo and a mirror so that you can uh, you can see and so um, it, it, there's another mirror on the other side for the other main main landing gear and uh, don't forget to switch on the wheel well light if you're trying to use this at night. First time you look through the viewer, it it will take you a while to um to, to find what you're looking for. It's actually pretty tricky to use. Um and I recommend those of you still flying originals or classics, do on a on a turnaround when the passengers aren't there, go down the cabin, open the um open the hatch to the viewer and have a look and familiar, familiarize yourself with, with, with what you're looking at because the chances are if it happens the captain will be sending the um, you down if you're the FO uh, to, to, to go look at this. Uh, and eventually this is what you should be able to see. Um, three red marks on the undercarriage if they line up and you, that means that your gear is down and locked. The nose gear viewer, this is the one on the flight deck again it's only you know originals and classics. Uh, there's a small hinge panel and uh, there's a, uh, a long tube to direct your eye to the correct place to see the downlock marks which are two red arrows pointing at each other. So th th this, this tube's got an acrylic upper window uh, and, a, and a glass window at the bottom. Acrylic at the top uh, for visibility. Glass one at the bottom. Um, it it's it's for impact resistance because obviously being near the nose gear, I mean all kinds of stuff could be thrown up on it, and it, you know it, it it's in quite a vulnerable position. It could um, you know could get stones and chips and what have you um, flung at it. Um, both of them are a quarter of an inch thick, and there are four small holes in that viewer tube for cabin air to to flow over it to reduce the fogging. So it's got a, a built-in permanent defogging system. Um, and, and there are slots to give water drainage from the viewer. And uh, I don't know if anyone can think what the last window might be. Um, oh, sorry, one one more photo there of the of the nose gear viewer, quite a clean one. It's uh, it's the APU fire extinguisher. Um, originals and early classics had uh, APU fire extinguisher bottle pressure gauge inspection window. 
uh, located on the, uh, the, the the sort of right aft lower surface of the fuselage. Um, on on the photo, I've included the the, the fire extinguisher indication buttons there to um, so you you know to orientate you where this is. So it's a small round plug type acrylic window flush with the exterior surface of the fuselage. Uh, mounted on a double ring, secured in position by a, by a rubber seal and aluminium retainer plate, and you can see the the six mounting uh, bolt and nut plates there on the uh, on the photo. It's not designed to take aircraft pressure loads, which is why it's just a single acrylic window, and uh, it doesn't need to take pressure loads because it's in an unpressurized part of the aircraft. And finally. Um, let me just mention the 737 Tech Group. I, I, I did mention it earlier in the, the, the presentation, um, but this presentation used several photos that were not actually from my own personal collection, unlike pretty much all of the other ones in previous videos, um, particularly some of the more spectacular window failures. So I'd just like to thank everybody who responded to it, to my appeal on this group for photos of, uh, of, of window failures and, you know, what have you. That post um, reached 110,000 people and got hundreds of responses, so I, I, I thank you all. Uh, I, I apologies, I, you know, I, I didn't have time to, to, to name check you all individually, but you, you know, you know who you are and, and rest assured your, your photos in this, in this video will, will help aid the understanding of, of your colleagues. It's worth mentioning that this group's open to anybody to, uh, to, to join, to discuss technical aspects of the 737. Um, what I'm finding is, is that, you know, since I started doing these videos, I'm, I'm getting a lot of inquiries uh, of technical questions I unfortunately I, ju I just don't have time to, to respond in individually to to any technical questions I mean I'm I'm trying to produce these videos I'm also you know holding down um, my, my, my job as a pilot so you know um, my, my 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 time's in in fairly short supply, so please, if you do have any technical questions on you know windows or any of the subjects, post them up here in the in the the seven three seven tech group. That's the uh, the link to it down at the bottom right there, and there are thousands of knowledgeable people on on there who will who will have an answer for you. Um, often a better answer than me because you got engineers on there as well as pilots. Um, you know it's it it spans everything. Okay, so um, thank you again for, for watching the video. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, subscribe uh, to the channel, and share it amongst your colleagues. Um, thanks once again.